Almost two years ago, I was found sleeping rough here on Hove Seafront by the local newspaper. For them, it was the ideal story. A known face from television, homeless near to Christmas, no room at the inn sort of thing, and someone brought down by huge debts and drink. The headlines almost wrote themselves. Riches to rags, lost it all, and white collar tramp. But for me, being found here probably saved my life. I'd been homeless for about a year and sleeping rough in this area for about three months. I'd lost everything, my house, my job, my marriage, all my possessions, my driving license, and I'd had to go bankrupt. And that was all really as a result of being dependent on alcohol. As winter was approaching, I was getting weaker and weaker and uh, a more frequent visitor to A&E. They were grim times then and probably could only have got bleaker. Without that miraculous intervention, I'd still be here now and probably looking like the stereotypical dosser, unkempt, unwashed and shambling and almost certainly very ill. Instead, I'm happy, healthy and addiction free. But should I ever forget how lucky I am, I only have to look back at the two ITV documentaries that were made about what happened to realise just how bad things were. Well, if getting off the park bench was the turning point, getting off the booze was the lifetime reward. I had 28 days of rehab in London, followed by weekly meetings here in Hove, so-called aftercare. For me, it worked because I really wanted it to. I was convinced that the alternative would be fatal. The focus of rehab was Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps, but that's not a route that I chose. I didn't want alcoholism to be replaced by recoveryism. Because addiction usually leads to selfishness, secrecy and manipulation, those around the addict can suffer. That certainly happened in my case. Well, part of getting free of addiction and getting back some sort of peace of mind is admitting that fact, repairing the damage and moving on. I've often wondered, actually, Mandy, what, because I can hardly remember, what I was like um, two years ago. Well, pretty terrible. But the thing is that I was pretty drunk myself, so it's, it's all a bit of a blur. Because that's the thing about an alcoholic, is that they, they are very secretive, or I was very secretive and manipulative and, and, and pretty well untrustworthy, because all yes. that mattered was alcohol. Yes, yeah, and sometimes we used to arrange to meet after I finished work and, and you weren't there and I used to wait maybe an hour or so and, and you, your phone was, you never answered your phone because you didn't hear it because you were drunk or you switched mm. off, and, but I knew that you were drunk. Finally the story broke in all the newspapers, I mean, what was your reaction then? Because you got involved yourself, didn't you, with the documentary? Yeah, I got involved um, in the actual documentary and also, obviously, the, with the papers, they wanted to have an interview. Um, but I remember um, Alex, she rang me, uh, it was around Christmas time, when mm. you actually were living rough, um, with a, someone that was going to put you through the Priory. And, yes. and I remember being at the bus stop thinking, this is probably the best Christmas present I could ever have. Yes. And obviously you could personally ever have. Um, because I just knew that you'd obviously already been in Priory and it didn't work the first time, but that was yeah. because you were obviously in the same sort of circle, same situation. Exactly. But exactly. this time it was different because you weren't in the same circles. You were living on the streets. This was your only way out. If you didn't do it this time, um, you never would. And I, and I think that it was literally the best Christmas present you could have. And two years on, you're still going strong. And um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful feeling to know that uh, your dad is here. Whenever I want you to, when I want to ring you up, yeah. you know, you're always. I know you're going to be sober. Yeah. Whenever I meet you, I know you're going to be sober. Yeah. So the last two years have been about rebuilding my life out of the ruins that it was in, giving it back some sort of structure. Now, normally that would mean finding meaningful and rewarding work. Well, that would be hard enough uh, for a 56-year-old ex-park bench drunk in the boom times. But in the current deep recession, it's been near impossible. 
But fate once again intervened. Here I am now working with In Excess Television, able to draw on 30 years of broadcast television experience, my rock bottom and recovery, to, I hope, help others in a similar situation. Now that my life has come full circle, and I'm healthy and happy again, perhaps even better than I ever was, what have I learnt and what can I pass on to others? First, I discovered that I was not alone and that I didn't have to suffer alone. Many thousands were out there like me and many thousands had got through it. Indeed, on this website, we have dozens of stories of people who have turned their lives around. Second, I found that life was just so much better on the other side. Chemical-free happiness seems that much more real. Life is quite simply easier. Being an addict is so exhausting. Third, I can now see there are many different paths to recovery. It's not about particular dogmas, books, techniques, meetings or steps, although all of those can help. It's whatever is right for you. And fourth, whatever path you choose, whatever is best for you, it will have the same elements. A total commitment to change, complete honesty, relaxed openness and constant awareness of yourself and those around you. Addiction can be a very dark and solitary place. It's a prison of our own making and one from which many people never escape. But freedom is possible when you find the real desire to change.